In this video we're going to look at how charge compensation can influence an XPS measurement. When we perform an XPS measurement the objective is to identify peaks within the data that we can assign to binding energy and calculate the intensity of these peaks so we can infer chemical state from both binding energy and relative intensities. We must have confidence that these peaks are genuine peaks and relate to the sample chemistry and not to the sample and how it was measured. In order to investigate this, a particular sample has been measured multiple times using different charge compensation state and acquisition conditions. And by doing so, we can observe how the structures within these data change as a result of the way these data were measured. We can understand, first of all, whether we can trust the data, and secondly, how we would go about measuring a sample such as this one so that we can trust the data. A photoemission peak represents a collection of electrons that have been emitted from a sample with a characteristic binding energy. and The binding energy is calculated from the kinetic energy of the electrons as they arrive at the detector and the photon energy used to excite these electrons. If we consider the photoemission process, then what is occurring is electrons are leaving the surface. And if electrons leave the surface without any electrons returning to the surface, a positive charge will build up. So we must have charge compensation for two reasons. First of all, if we allow a charge to continuously build up, then the energy that we would like to characterize these electrons by in terms of binding energy will alter by virtue of the fact that these electrons will be retarded by different potentials at the surface over time. And so we will have either broad peaks or peaks that move as a function of time. And this is not useful. The other aspect of charge compensation is that we would like a stable state. So that is, it doesn't necessarily have to be a neutral state, but what it does have to be is a state where the charge remains constant. If we have any variation in charge as a function of time, even if it's a small oscillation, this will produce a broadening of the photoemission peaks, so we lose energy resolution. So our ability to identify binding energy and identify well-formed peaks is contingent on having a suitable charge compensation mechanism that might be a combination of low energy electrons returning to the surface using a filament or an electron gun and then potentially also an iron gun. These are all mechanisms that are designed to maintain a, a stable charge state at the surface to allow the measurement of XPS spectra where the binding energy can be relied upon. The first of these measurements is performed without charge compensation. And we can observe how this measurement alters from what we would expect by looking at the element library. And we'll introduce a set of elements to indicate the markers that of interest here. So we've got nitrogen, oxygen, silicon and, and some carbon. And the thing that we observe when we put up these element markers is that in each case the photoemission peaks all sit to the left hand side of the element markers. While it's possible the element markers are not precise for any given material, to see such a pattern where they're all offset to the left suggests that these peaks have all lost energy. So we would have expected this spectrum to be acquired with a charge compensation state where a positive charge exists. That is to say, each one of these peaks now arrives with a kinetic energy less than the expected energy for a given photoemission line. The next thing to observe is that for each one of these peaks, we also have two peaks. So this is the nitrogen peak. And if we step through the data and look at the other peaks, as the oxygen peak, we see two peaks that have a very similar pattern. Moving the opposite direction, if we now look at the carbon, it has two peaks. And then we carry on going, we see that we have silicon, that's the 2s, and there's the 2p. And the pattern seems to be reproduced across the entire energy range. So this is a, a classic case of charge compensation, where we have some form of different charge states as data are being acquired. So the next experiment is performed with charge compensation active. And when we consider the change that occurs, I've just 
overlaid the spectrum with charge compensation in the interval that corresponded to the silicon peaks. So if I now just adjust these, you can see that we've got silicon peaks and these perhaps look like you've got an oxide and an elemental silicon. That is to say there are two peaks here. That would be typical of a, a silicon oxide. However, once again, if we look back across the spectrum and see how these other photoemission peaks appear, that's the carbon, and now for the nitrogen, and we're again seeing a very similar pattern. Oxygen. So all of them seem to have the same structure. So even with the charge compensation active, these data are not to be trusted in terms of chemical state. It's always a good idea to repeat a measurement. And so this next measurement is just a repeat of charge compensation. And even with just repeating the same measurement, we can see that there has been a small difference in the way these peaks are constructed. If we zoom out, we can have a look at some of these others. Is the same pattern repeated? And yes, again, we see that the one peak is smaller while the other one becomes larger. And is that true for the silicon? Yes, that is also being repeated. So this is giving a strong indication that charge compensation is an issue for this particular sample. The next question is, is it related to how these data were measured? And in this case, we can look at the acquisition parameters. And this tells us that the number of scans is 2 for a dwell time of 0.1. So this number of scans equals 2 means that these data were acquired by summing two consecutive measurements with a dwell time for each bin of 0.1 seconds. So while these peaks appear to be a single measurement, they're in fact two measurements. And it is entirely feasible that the difference in these peak positions are due to an alteration in charge state with time. Two scans were measured separately and potentially we've got two different peaks for two different scans. So the next measurement is based on using a single scan. So let's actually select both of these and what we will do is normalize. So now I've got another measurement that represents a single scan, not a, a double scan. And this is being measured without charge compensation. So you can see the shift that occurs with and without charge compensation. And this does look more like a single peak. So if we repeat that measurement, well, then there's a, a shift. So we can see there is the potential for measuring the data using two different sweeps to produce two different peaks. There is one other difference between these three measurements. The one that has charge compensation compared to the two without is different because this one is measured at pass energy 80 and with a full slot. Whereas these two were measured using a pass energy 160 and a 55 micron selected area aperture. So the analysis area of the sample for these two peaks here is very much smaller than the analysis area here, which is about 300 by 800 micron in dimensions, whereas these two have been measured using a 55 micron aperture and a higher pass energy, so that in principle that should give more signal. However, you can see that the signal to noise is not quite so good, and that's because the analysis area is, is really quite small by comparison. So the question really remains, is this a function of time or is this a function of the analysis area that is causing charge compensation issues for this particular sample? If it's the analysis area, then we are suggesting that we've got differential charging. That is to say, the charge compensation is not producing a uniform charge state across the sample. To work out if we've got differential charging, what we can do is measure a set of images. And in this case, the images are all acquired with energies that correspond to the nitrogen 1s peak. So all of these numbers down here represent binding energies, and each one of these VAMAS blocks represents an image. 
and you can see there's no obvious spatial information in these images. Nevertheless, if we go to the image processing dialog window and go to the color scales property page and select display spectrum, when activated, there's a point indicating the point at which a spectrum is being calculated from these images. That is to say that this represents the spectrum that corresponds to this pixel position. Now if I drag out a box and then I say set position, rather than a single pixel, all of these pixels within this box are now being summed in terms of spectra to produce this trace that we see here. So this represents a nitrogen 1S spectrum which is gathered from the stack of images that have all been acquired at different energy bins. So this is indicating we have what looks like a single peak. If I choose a different position by clicking and then say shift position, a box of the same size creates a new spectrum. And now we can see that there is a slight shift. Let me do this again. I'm choosing a position in the top left hand corner and I say shift position. If we look at this peak when I press this button, you can see it shifts. So it does look like there's differential charging. That is to say, the charge state at this point is different from the charge state at this point. So the reason this peak is moving is because when we consider the sample that is differentially charging, that for some reason the neutralization or the lack of neutralization is allowing a buildup of charge in one part of the sample that is different from another. And because the potential is different at these two points, we end up with a shift in any photoemission peak in terms of its kinetic energy that depends on the amount of charge in each one of these zones. We can investigate this further if we look at a bitmap that represents the type of distribution of these peak positions across the image. So this here has been constructed as an image that is based on how a photoemission peak is shifting in binding energy across this field of view. So this is about 900 by 900 microns. The analysis area that we were using for the spectroscopy mode was about 300 by about 800 microns. So the spectroscopy is subsampling this analysis area if we mark up the zones on this image that are different intensities in terms of these binding energies, then we'll have a set of pixels for which we should see a similar peak position. We can do this again by looking at the image processing, the color scale, and if we select the false color, then previously I've set up a, a range of false colors for these images so that we have at each different binding energy a pixel color corresponds and so when we sum all the pixels with the common color and form spectra pixels from these common colors we should end up with spectra that makes sense in terms of different nitrogen 1s peaks with binding energies that are shifted as a result of differential charging. So What I'm going to do now is define this as my false color image. Just verify that I have a mask that corresponds to this. So this is the mask that is currently active and I can apply this to these images that are currently overlaid in the active tile that are indicating that there is a nitrogen peak here. If I now use the sum spectra using colors, rather than using a box of pixels and summing the spectra at these pixels to form this spectrum here, the false colors will be summed to produce a set of different spectra. So I say sum spectra using colors. And rather than seeing a single spectrum, I now see a set of spectra. And these all correspond to the different colors in that false color image. So at this point, we have spectra that look like individual peaks, and they've all been shifted as a consequence of different charge state on the sample across that sample surface. 